tonight the prayer we're going to begin with, it's on the, uh, the Mary handout. So you'll see a handout there. Um, it's the oldest Marian prayer that we have uh, uh, on paper. Um, and it's called the Subtuum Presidium. Um, and it dates back to 250 A.D. So it's one of the oldest prayers that we, uh, one of the oldest, or the oldest Marian prayer uh, that we know of, that we have in writing. Um, so we're going to begin with that tonight. Um, yeah. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We fly to your patronage, O Holy Mother of God. Despise not our petitions and our necessities, but deliver us from all danger, O ever-glorious and blessed Virgin. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So tonight what we're going to do is go over uh, the fourth pillar of the Catechism on prayer, and we're also going to talk about Mary. So there's two different handouts uh, there. We're not going to get to all of the, the, the Marian stuff, but I gave you all the handouts. Um, if you're interested, there's some, it's not the best video, but it's, it's there. Uh, if you go to our YouTube uh, page, we did a class last year, I forget exactly when, we did a class where we spent uh, three nights on Mary. Um, and so those are the handouts from that, uh, from that class. And um, so let's begin. So we have those four pillars of the catechism. Uh, the, the creed, the sacraments, uh, the morality, and prayer. And so um, prayer is the final section. It's the shortest section of the catechism. Um, and when um, John Paul II was uh, uh, organizing this project of the catechism, uh, he was looking for people to and bishops to uh, uh, contribute from both the East and the West. And so the biggest contribution from the Eastern churches was this fourth pillar on the catechism. Um, and it was from a, uh, a uh, I forget his exact title because it's an Eastern church, so it's a little different. Um, but his name is Jean Corbon. And he was a, uh, uh, in Beirut, he was, a, I think, a, a prelate, or I don't, don't hold me to that, um, but he was a priest in Beirut, and he actually wrote part of this, or was composing part of this, uh, while being bombed uh, in Beirut in the uh, 80s and 90s. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, of all the things to write about, prayer is there. So, um, and, and if you if you get a chance to read it, it reads very differently than the other. Uh, uh, sections of the catechism. It's very beautiful uh, and he uses uh, just, it, it just does a fantastic job and it's just a great contribution overall. What is prayer? How do we understand prayer? And then the second part is uh, uh, the Our Father. Um, what I did was we're just going to look at a particular section of that first part. We're not going to get into the Our Father and we're not going to go through all of the uh, Old Testament uh, side of prayer that the catechism goes through. So we're going to begin here with in the age of the church, which is where your um, which is where this starts. Yeah. But it does okay. So sorry about that. Um, so like I said, we we uh, uh, we we're going to skip over some of that so that we can talk um, about Mary. So. But I do want to bring up those two, uh, they, two, they give us those two definitions. Prayer is a surge of the heart, but then also prayer is uh, the raising of one's mind and heart to God. Um, and you can, again, you can find this all uh, in the Catechism. And the thing about prayer is we all experience it uh, in a different way. It's, it's, uh, there are some things that, w that we all have in common when it comes to prayer, but there are things that are very particular. Why? Because prayer is a very intimate, uh, uh, a very intimate thing. It's, it's something that's very personal, and it's something that uh, uh, we go to the, our, our most inner core. You know, we don't simply just uh, uh, pray with our lips, or we don't simply just uh, ask for something nonchalantly. Um, but it's something that comes from our innermost core. And so uh, I love that they use that side also, that it's not just the heart, but also the mind. 
that the more we form ourselves uh, intellectually, the more we can bring that to prayer. The more we learn about who Christ is, the more we can bring that into our relationship, you know. Um, and so it's one of those things you think about your own relationships. It's, you don't just want to know something about your spouse, um, nor do you just want to sit, sit there next to your spouse. You want both. You want to know about them, but you also want to spend quiet time with them. Um, and so there's this, you know, intimate side to it, but there's also this, you know, uh, 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 it's not just good enough for me to, to buy, my, buy my wife coffee. But what? It's in the details, you know. Lots of cream, no sugar, uh, you know. Those, those, those particular things that only I would know uh, 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 are very important. And it's the same with our relationship with God. Yes, we have those commonalities with everybody, but also there's those intimate uh, details. The, the one thing that all prayer has in common is that at its foundation is humility. Um, uh, the very act of going to God in prayer shows that you are not God, He is, and He can help you. He, we are dependent upon Him. St. Augustine says that there are three virtues uh, needed for holiness. Does anybody know what they are? Humility, humility, humility. There you go. Humility, humility, humility. Uh, and so uh, uh, it's one of my kind of favorite quotes. He, he draws it out a little bit more, but he essentially says, humility, humility, humility. And so uh, uh, we go before God in that spirit of humility. And so this, uh, uh, in the life of the church, we begin at Pentecost. Um, the, uh, at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was given to the church as a guide. The Spirit who teaches the church and recalls for her everything that Jesus said was also to form her in the life of prayer. And so uh, the early church fathers, they said that the, uh, the Holy Spirit was kind of that uh, uh, took place, uh, came, you know, uh, was really manifested in the liturgy, and that was that living memory of the church. So how did the church remember? You know, uh, apostolic succession is not a very long game of telephone, but it is something that is uh, protected by the Holy Spirit. It is something um, that is lived out with the Spirit as its guide. Like we remember those words of Christ, he said, uh, I will be with you always until the end of the age. Twenty-six, twenty-four. if you want to follow along. It says, in the first community of Jerusalem, believers quote, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. This sequence is characteristic of the church's prayer, founded on the apostolic faith, authenticated by charity, and nourished by the Eucharist. And if you look at that scripture, it's from Acts 2.42. Devoted themselves, the teaching of the apostles, that should hopefully ring a bell to maybe the Apostles' Creed, so the Creed, to the fellowship, to that life and community, that moral life, to the breaking of the bread, namely the Eucharist, and to the prayers. And so there we have, in a very kind of rudimentary way, the four pillars that the Catechism tries to explain. The, the Apostles' teaching, uh, the breaking of the bread, the fellowship, and the prayer. This is how the, the early church, and this is how the book of Acts kind of describes the, the life of the new Christian. Um, and so like we said, the Holy Spirit keeps that memory of Christ in the church. She's also the guide in developing formulations of the faith and spiritual and liturgical traditions. And so when we talk about doctrines, the church does not invent new doctrines. The church does not uh, uh, invent new dogmas and things, namely that they develop. So the church has a particular understanding. How does that develop? Uh, in the same way, you know, you have an acorn. You know, it looks very, it may look very different than the big oak tree, but we know that one came from the other. So even though they may look a little different, we know that there is that continuity between the two. Uh, in the same way, the early church, you know, uh, think about, think about the, the, the early church. You don't even have a New Testament. You have the Old Testament, and you have uh, a Christ who has just ascended into heaven. And you were given the task to go preach, teach, baptize. 
We don't have, you know, nice equipment, you know, catechisms, even Bibles for that matter. Uh, uh, how do you talk about Christ? How do you talk about Christ correctly? Um, you know, uh, there, there's an entire history of heresies, you know, um, of people getting it wrong. So how do we do this? And so that story of the early church is a very beautiful story of uh, the working of the Holy Spirit and guiding those early Christians to formulate, to be able to pr pick particular words to explain the truth that they had received. They had this truth. They understood that, yes, Jesus is God. Yes, Jesus is man. Now, how do we talk about that? How do we explain that to others? Fully God, fully man, half man, half God. Is he, you know, you know, three quarter, you know, 51, 49. How do we, how do we, uh, how do we understand this? And so, through, uh, 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 through the working of the Holy Spirit, uh, those, those traditions came, those doctrines and dogmas developed, our understanding developed, um, but they themselves, it was not anything new. The Catechism says that the forms of prayer revealed in the apostolic and canonical scriptures remain the normative of Christian prayer. And so that's why uh, 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 scripture remains at the heart of the Christian's prayer life. When you go to Mass, scripture is everywhere. Uh, if you pray the Liturgy of the Hours, it's deeply rooted in scripture. It's praying the Psalms and uh, uh, other readings as well. And so, as we go through these forms of prayer, uh, or that's, that's the next thing we're going to go through, is the, the forms of prayer. The first is blessing. Blessing is a two-way prayer. God blesses us with a gift, and we respond by blessing God and using that gift to glorify Him. And it's important for us to understand that, because we never think of ourselves as blessing God. That sounds very uh, arrogant, to say that we would bless God. But think of it this way, you know, if, if, if you know, uh, I did such a great job at teaching that, that John bought me a beautiful vase, because um, I know he loves to shop for vases. So he finds one and he picks one out and brings it to me and says, you know, here's a gift, uh, thank you. And thank you, John. You know. So, I, you know, later on I'm like, all right, well, I should, you know, I'll invite John over for, for dinner. So John comes over to my house and he, he walks in. Uh, uh, and, and while my kids are running around, he sees his vase uh, front and center there on the table just uh, overflowing with beautiful flowers. What would, what would be that, that feeling? What would be your understanding? Of, wow. You know, it's not, you know, holding kids' crayons up on the shelf. But uh, uh, John would feel some sort of uh, pride. John would feel, in a, in a good way, John would feel some sort of, 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 of uh, satisfaction, of blessing. Why? Because he gave me a gift, and not only did I just use it, but I used it uh, uh, the way that it was made. I used it uh, for good, and I used it to, to uh, uh, express beauty and, and all these things. And so when God blesses us with, with whatever it is he gives us, gifts, uh, whatever, when we return that blessing, uh, we use those gifts in the way that's proper. And so we have to remember that kind of two-way street with blessing. God gives us those gifts and we bless Him in return by using them correctly. We use it to glorify Him. And second, adoration. Adoration is the first attitude of man acknowledging that he is a creature before his Creator. Again, that idea of humility. Adoration is due to God alone. Which is important because we're going to talk about Mary. But it's important to know adoration is given to God alone. Second, uh, prayer of petition. Our petition begins with acknowledging that we are dependent on God. Again, humility. Our prayer of petition recognizes our relationship with God, that creature-creator relationship. Um, the first movement of the prayer of petition is asking forgiveness, and we see this uh, uh, especially in the Our Father. Um, we see this in the movement of the Mass. We have the Confidior in the very beginning of Mass where we ask God forgiveness. You know, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, we ask God for forgiveness. Asking for forgiveness is, a, is the prerequisite for both the Eucharistic liturgy and personal prayer. 
And so it's important for us to take that, uh, especially that asking forgiveness, and bring it to our personal prayer. Um, it's difficult, why? Because it does take some examination of our own selves, which is never a fun thing to do. Um, uh, but we understand that it is very necessary and it's good for us uh, to do that in our relationship with God. Christian petition is centered on the desire and the search for the kingdom to come. In keeping with the teaching of Christ, there is a hierarchy in these petitions. We pray first for the kingdom, then for what is necessary to welcome it, and lastly, what, is, what we need to cooperate with its coming. And so, uh, this, this kingdom of, of God, we ask God to usher in that kingdom, to help, help us uh, be a part of that, and participate in it in a very beautiful way. Every need can become our petition because of Christ. Um, and St. Paul tells us, reminds us to pray at all times. And one thing I always try to remind people, if you want to pray at all times, you have to pray at certain times. Um, that we have to take those certain times out during the day to focus solely on prayer. Um, and so, uh, you know, you look at, uh, you know, people like, you know, John Paul II, even, you know, Pope Benedict, Pope Francis, they all took significant parts of their day uh, to spend in prayer. Um, I remember a story of John Paul II that he, he had said Mass and he, everybody was waiting for him uh, out front uh, uh, of Mass for him to, to greet. And, and they waited for 30, 45 minutes or so. And uh, uh, I remember there was, a, I, there was, I forget exactly what the, there were some secular reporters there and they were like, you know, gosh, what's, what's, he's making these people wait, you know, it's hot out here, it's all these things. Um, and he, he comes out and he says, you know, I apologize for, for, for taking so long, but I had to give thanksgiving for God. I had to give thanksgiving to God for everything that he's given me and most especially for the Eucharist. And so after celebrating the Eucharist, he was giving God that thanksgiving. Um, and so just uh, uh, if we want to pray at all times, we have to pray at certain times. And that's why the church, again, holds uh, Sunday Mass uh, in the highest regard. So, prayer of petition is that asking for a particular need. Prayer of intercession is asking on behalf of another. And it is a prayer of petition which leads us to pray as Jesus did, of asking for that intercession. Because Christ is the one mediator, we, can, we also can intercede for others with our prayers. In the age of the church, Christian intercession participates in Christ's as an expression of the communion of saints. And so, as Christ became one of us and interceded for us, became that one mediator uh, between uh, uh, God and man to bridge that eternal gap, we too are able to participate in that way. Uh, whether it be through our prayers, whether it be through our sufferings, whether it be through any of the gifts that God's given us, we can participate in that intercession. Prayer of Thanksgiving. Um, the word Eucharist in Greek literally means Thanksgiving. And without Christ, we are utterly hopeless. And so this idea of Thanksgiving should be of, uh, uh, of, of utmost importance to us as Christians. Um, the Eucharist is the representation of the crucifixion, which is that saving work of God, and so it is rightly that we give God thanks for the Eucharist. Um, the Catechism says, as in the prayer of petition, every event and need can become an offering of thanksgiving. Um, and it's, you know, like the, I guess, kind of the, the, the saying, you know, the attitude of gratitude that uh, especially, it, it's always one of those things I find quite boggling. Um, sometimes even to, you know, uh, I used to uh, be a youth minister at the, the last parish I was at and talking to high school kids. Some of them, you know, were struggling with, you know, believing in God, believing in, you know, existence of God. But they all had the common experience that whenever something happened to them that was good, they felt gratitude. Where does that feeling come from? Why would we have a, 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 a desire to be thankful 
for something if there's nothing? What, what, is that, what is that stir uh, in us to, to, to thank somebody, you know? Um, and so I, I, I always like to, to, to point to that, especially because uh, we've all had those situations where something unexpectedly happens to us, you know? We, we, we catch all of the green lights on, you know, going through, you know, uh, uh, the loop in Broadway. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's a beautiful thing, you know. Uh, we have the, that understanding of gratitude for things that we can, the things that we are not the cause of. Again, God put that desire within us. And lastly, the prayer of praise. And praise is recognizing that God is God and we are not. It's the, the, the prayer of praise is a very simple and humble prayer. It is entirely disinterested and rises to God, louds Him, gives Him glory for His own sake, quite beyond what He has done, but simply because He is. And so it's one of those things where it's easy for us to, to, to recognize God when He does something for us, when we receive a particular blessing, when we really need something, it's easy for us to go to God in, in prayer. But what about the everyday? What about just, you know what? God, you know, God is. The, the, the fact that He is, the fact that we are still here. My continued existence is completely dependent upon Him. That's a, a wonderful thing, while not being the most poetic thing to say, but <laughs> it is, it's so true. Um, and so that prayer of praise is very simple, but like it says, completely disinterested. Uh, paragraph 2643 says that the Eucharist contains and expresses all forms of prayer. So all the ones we just talked about. Um, it is the pure offering of the whole body of Christ to the glory of God's name. And according to the traditions of the East and the West, it is the sacrifice of praise. And so all of these forms, while we, while we should uh, imitate them in our own daily prayer life, they culminate most especially in the Eucharist. Again, that's why the Eucharist stands at the heart of our prayer. Everyone must have a will to pray, but also learn how to pray. Like we said, very you know, similar to morality, there are things that are very self-evident, there are things that are very natural, but there's also things due to concupiscence that we must learn, that we must be formed in. So, through a living transmission within the believing and praying church, the Holy Spirit teaches the children of God how to pray. And so it is the Holy Spirit who is that master of prayer. And so, that's why it's so important for us to ask for the Holy Spirit. Like those apostles at Pentecost, it's important for us. Um, because, you know, we think a lot of times about, you know, that relationship with Jesus Christ. So important, so key. Uh, 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 to have that Christocentric lifestyle. But at the same time, we also need uh, to pray to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. I'm sure, you know, it's one of those things, you know, the poor Holy Spirit gets the dove, the fire, um, you, know, or, you know, smoke, uh, you know, a cloud. You know, uh, the Holy Spirit is a person. A fully divine person who is actively participating in the life of the church, who is actively participating in our lives, particularly through the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. And so it's important for us to continue to turn to the Holy Spirit to, to guide us. Um, and especially, kind of, you know, I always like to, to, to ask the Holy Spirit to protect me the same way that, you know, He protects the church, you know, to help say the right things, to help do the right things, and uh, uh, if I'm going to do something wrong, stop me, you know? <laughs> help me out in that way. Um, if I'm going to say something wrong, let me trip over my words. Let somebody ask a question that's completely off topic, you know? Um, and so it's one of those things to, for us to remember that the Holy Spirit is there uh, 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 to help guide us in that same way. Catechism says that the Holy Spirit is the living water. From that living water, there are many wellsprings that Christ calls us to pray from. And so, uh, and I, uh, something to think about is uh, um, kind of a way to understand uh, 
baptism is that when baptism places what? An indelible mark on our soul. Cannot be removed. Once we are baptized, we are baptized. Uh, we cannot be unbaptized. We cannot be rebaptized. Uh, an analogy to understand that um, is, is, is to understand that indelible mark as a fountain. That God establishes this fountain in your soul. From that fountain, God will pour His grace. His grace will come through that fountain. Why? Because baptism initiates us into that life of the church, into that life of Christ. We become one with Christ in baptism. And so God pours His grace through that fountain. I think this is a good kind of partner to that image, that the Holy Spirit is that living water. From that living water, there are many wellsprings that Christ calls us to pray from. Uh, uh, mortal sin essentially shuts the water off. Going to confession replenishes the water, renews uh, that. It does that, and it's important to remember, Mortal sin does not destroy the fountain. It does not wipe the fountain away, but simply turns the water off. The fountain will always remain. It is that indelible mark that cannot be removed. And so that Holy Spirit comes forth and calls us. And I think it's important to remember that it's not all going to be the same. We all have those different areas uh, we all are surrounded by different people. We have diff different circumstances in our lives. And so, as each of us are unique, so the grace we receive will be just as unique, just as particular. Jason? Sure. You know, they, 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 there's this American woman, and Jesus says, the living water. Is that the same? I mean, he was talking about his Holy Spirit. You know, when he says, if, if you had asked for me, who was... Who was giving you the water? Right. You, and, you know, what's is that referring to the same thing? Yeah, I would say, I would say, yeah, and it's, and it's one of those things. Does it say it explicitly like that in Scripture? No, but it is that same, uh, that same Holy Spirit that comes, uh, uh, like we pray in the Creed. The Holy Spirit comes from the Father and the Son, okay. and so that living water that Christ talked about Himself being, okay. is the same living water that when He hung on the crucifix, He said, "Father, into Your hands I commend." my spirit. Gotcha. Um, and so uh, it's, that same, it's that same spirit, that same living water. <clears throat> Sacred scripture is most important, period. It is Christ, the Word made flesh. The Catechism says, For we speak to Him when we pray, we listen to Him when we read the divine oracles. And so that's why uh, practices like Lexio Divina, where you read a particular scripture passage uh, four different times, um, really kind of chewing, chewing on the Word of God, uh, meditating on it, allowing it to, to, to sit with us. Um, it's a very important, and uh, Lexio Divina is one of those very ancient kind of uh, prayers, uh, prayer practices of the church. Guigo the Carthusian, he said that seeking and reading and you will find and meditating, knock in mental prayer and it will be open to you by contemplation. Um, and I love that image because it brings in those different, those different expressions of prayer, um, but it also brings in that inner desire that we genuinely seek God, that we have a participation in that. God does not force His grace on us. God does not uh, 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 kind of uh, just expect us to do these things. He waits for us. He waits for us. And so we must seek Him. We must uh, uh, look for Him. In the sacramental liturgy of the church, the mission of Christ and the Holy Spirit proclaims, makes present, and communicates the mystery of salvation, which is continued in the heart of prayer. And so when you think about the story of salvation, of, of God saving the world, you think essentially probably most of us kind of stop at Jesus. Well, yes. Objectively speaking, it does stop with Jesus Christ. He paid the ultimate price. He paid all of our debts. But what? We, it, it, salvation is continuing today. People are being saved today by the merits of Jesus Christ that happened long ago. But that story of salvation is continued and it is played out in our lives today. Most especially, it's, 
it's played out in our prayer life. We already talked uh, yesterday about the theological virtues, um, and it's important to understand that uh, uh, these three virtues especially play a very important part in our own prayer life. Uh, that virtue of faith, um, that we look for Christ, that we understand Christ for the reason for so, is, is the reason for so many things. We see the world through the eyes of the faith. The world looks at the crucifix and sees a dead man hanging on a cross. We look at a crucifix and we see a sign of our hope and salvation. We see, uh, 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 the, the, the world sees a piece of bread and some wine. The Catholic sees the Eucharist. Jesus giving himself in a very vulnerable and loving way uh, 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 to his people. And so we look differently at the world with the eyes of faith. We also pray in hope. If we did not have hope, like humility, we would not really have a need for prayer. And so it's important for us to understand uh, that virtue of hope and to ask for us. Ask for it. And of, of everything else, like we had talked about, love is that highest virtue. And so love is the source of prayer. Not only for us, but love is also the source. Why? Because God initiated love. We did not love God first. He loved us. He is the one that initiated that love. We respond in love. And so it's important um, uh, for us to remember that, that God is the one who initiates. We respond. The Catechism has a, a particular section which I always love to, to hit on um, because it's something probably that I'm most guilty of. Um, and that is kind of the idea of today. Uh, in, the, in the events of each day, the Holy Spirit is offered at all times. And the Catechism says, It is in the present that we, can, that we encounter Him. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, but today. Oh, that today you would hearken to His voice, harden not your hearts. How much of our days do we spend, or how much of our day do we spend thinking about yesterday? Dwelling on tomorrow, worrying about something that happened, worrying about something to come. We need to practice kind of that, that, that uh, uh, very simple thing of, you know, not to sound cliche or anything, but to, to live in the moment, um, but in a, in a Christian way, to where we understand that right now God's grace is at work, that we are participating with God's grace. We give Him praise, we give Him thanks. No matter what we're doing, no matter who we're going to interact with, God can be there. And so uh, uh, it's important for us to be you know, present in the present. And like I said, I think I, I love this point because I'm uh, very guilty of it, or of not following it. 2660 says... Prayer in the events of each day and each moment is one of the secrets of the kingdom revealed to little children, to the servants of Christ, to the poor of the Beatitudes. It is right and good to pray so that the coming of the kingdom of justice and peace may influence the march of history. But it is just as important to bring the help of prayer into humble everyday situations. All forms of prayer can be the leaven to which the Lord compares the kingdom. And I love that idea of leaven. What does leaven do? It makes kind of what, what, it, what is essentially dead, it makes it rise. Um, and uh, um, one of the early church fathers said that uh, what the soul is to the body, the Christian is to the world. And so the soul animates the body. Uh, uh, everything that is happening within my soul right now is coming out in my words, in my emotions, however, whatever that may look like. Uh, uh, and so it, it's the same for the world. The world is essentially dead without Christ. And so the Christian animates that world. The Christian can bring, is the one that brings Christ into that world. And so that Holy Spirit being the master of prayer, that 
the Holy Spirit draws us to what? To pray to the Father. And so, prayer to the Father is always directed through Jesus Christ. By no other name can we come to know the Father. The Catechism states, The sacred humanity of Jesus is therefore the way by which the Holy Spirit teaches us to pray to God our Father. And so that same Spirit that Christ prayed and did the will of the Father in His earthly life, in His passion, His death, His resurrection, in that same Spirit uh, we pray. Uh, that same Spirit we, we in, encounter in the sacraments and in the church, and so it is there also that we pray. Like that, you know, like especially like the, the second commandment calls us uh, uh, to honor God's name. The divine name, Jesus, contains everything. All divine, all human, all creation, all salvation of the human to the divine. Everything is there in the name of Christ. Um, and one of the oldest prayers that we have, it's simply called the Jesus Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us sinners. Um, it's one of the oldest prayers that we have, uh, uh, especially one of the oldest prayers we have asking for reconciliation, asking for God's forgiveness. The invocation of the holy name of Jesus is the simplest way of praying always. When the holy name is repeated often by a humbly attentive heart, the prayer is not lost by heaping up empty phrases, but holds fast to the word and brings forth fruit and patience. This prayer is possible at all times. Because it is not one occupation among others, but the only occupation, that, uh, that of loving God, which animates and transfigures every action in Christ Jesus. And so, uh, uh, this, this simple prayer of simply saying the name of Jesus it is a powerful prayer, it is a humble prayer, um, and especially when you think of the words of Christ, to, to come to me like little children. How much more childlike, not childish, but childlike, is that prayer of simply praying uh, uh, the prayer or the name Jesus. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So every time we begin to pray to Jesus, it is, it is the Holy Spirit who draws us on the way of prayer by His prevenient grace. And so it's kind of one of those things where, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, what came first, grace or grace? Um, uh, it's grace that moves us to pray. And it's grace that we receive from God. It's grace that helps us cooperate uh, with, with God's grace. Um, so everything that is good, everything um, that is holy, is a grace from God. All God asks of us is to work with it, is to cooperate with it. Like we said, the Holy Spirit is the interior master of Christian prayer. And so if we want to, if, if we struggle in our prayer life, turn to the Holy Spirit. That is the first place. If you are confirmed, you have those gifts of the Holy Spirit as permanent dispositions. Those gifts of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, um, piety, fortitude, uh, fear of the Lord, counsel. Those are permanent dispositions to you from the sacrament, those gifts of the Holy Spirit. We bring those to prayer, um, and especially if we struggle in prayer, which all of us do at different uh, uh, ebbs and flows of our life, it's important for us to turn to the Holy Spirit to bring us back um, and to uh, uh, help us. We'll talk about uh, Mary in a second. The communion of saints are, a power, are powerful intercessors for us here on earth as they stand in the fullness of truth. The saints have also left behind writings, prayers, spiritualities, and traditions that are also beneficial, or that are also, uh, they benefit our sanctification. And so we have, you know, if you just look at the, the kind of the, the index of the, of the 
um, the catechism, or you just look at the footnotes of the catechism, almost every page has something from one of the saints. You know, um, and when you think about kind of the idea of God becoming man, that God makes Himself known in the human person of Christ, that uh, uh, some of these saints they live their life in a most real way of being Christ-like. Some of them to the point of actually starting to look like Christ physically. St. Francis of, of Assisi, for example, had the stigmata. His physical body started to look like Christ. That is it's simply amazing. Um, and so it's important for us to turn to the saints, not only in their writings, but also in intercessory prayer. It's important to understand the church uh, when she says that the Christian family is the first place of education and prayer. It, it goes so far as to call the family the domestic church. That it should not be from the lips of Father in his beautiful homily uh, uh, that the child first hears the name of Jesus. That it happens first in the home. And so uh, uh, the church goes so far as to call the family that, that little church. Sorry, because of time, I'm going to go through these somewhat quickly. Expressions of prayer. So we, we had the forms of prayer, um, and now the expressions. So there's three main uh, expressions of prayer, vocal, meditation, and contemplative prayer. They have in common all the recollection of the heart. And so uh, uh, before we go to prayer, we don't go necessarily... Uh, 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 we go, yes, in haste, but we don't go kind of uh, haphazardly into prayer. We go with a recollected heart. We go with a, you know, a calm spirit. Um, vocal prayer involves the senses, but comes necessarily from the heart. Christ taught his disciples the Lord's Prayer, which is a vocal prayer. Meditation is a prayerful quest engaging thought, imagination, emotion, and desire. Its goal is to make our faith the subject considered by confronting it with the reality of our own life. So we take a particular aspect of the faith, um, and, you know, uh, whether it be you know, Christ's passion. You know, it's good to meditate on that during Lent. You know, the passion of Christ. Thinking about everything that Christ went through in His passion. That's why we pray the Stations of the Cross. Why? So that we go step by step with Christ from being condemned to being crucified. That we go through Him, go with Him on that way so that we can make it part of our own life. Um, Ignatian spirituality very much involves the, the, the senses and the imagination. Uh, many exercises of St. Ignatius involve you of, of placing yourself within a particular story, making yourself one of the characters, obviously not Christ, but making yourself present there in the story, seeing what's happening, being present kind of in that moment. Contemplative prayer is different than meditation. Contemplative prayer is the simple expression of the mystery of prayer. It is a gaze of faith fixed on Jesus, an attentiveness to the Word of God, and a silent love. And so, uh, somebody asked St. John Vianney one time uh, what he did when he went to adoration. You know, they're like, you know, you go all the time, what do you, what did it, what do, you do? And he, he simply said, I look at him, and he looks at me. It is a gaze. And if, you've, if you read the book of Job, what is it that finally satisf satisfies Job, uh, living a, a very painful life? It is the gaze of God. It is seeing God. And so uh, contemplative prayer is when we enter into that gaze. We, we simply are with God. There is a, a, a filial gaze of faith, a listening, a silence, and it is very unitive. However, we know that what? It is not easy. That prayer is a battle. Um, prayer is both a gift of grace, but also a determined response on our part. We have to respond to God's grace. We pray like we had talked about earlier. We pray as we live because we live as we pray. 
And so as Christians, prayer is the center of that life. Before everything we do, especially big things, it's important for us to pray. Some objections that we run into in prayer. First, erroneous conceptions of prayer. Various currents of thought, our own experience of failure. It's very easy to become uh, just kind of uh, uh, downtrodden with prayer, saying, you know what, I've tried this. Seven and a half minutes is as, as much as I can ever go. You know, I, that's it, I quit. You know, it's very easy for us to, to fall into that trap. And so it's important for us to continue to persevere in that prayer. Above all, humble, humble vigilance of heart. That we, especially the two things of distraction and dryness. Those two are probably the biggest things that draw us away from prayer. Um, uh, a lot of times it's, you know, you spend your day trying to remember everything you have to do. And you say, you know what, I'm just going to pray. As soon as you start praying, here come all those things that you just forgot. Uh, they come flooding in. And so it's important for us, as good as they might be, to put them, put them back out as soon as they come in. Um, uh, turn them away uh, and turn to prayer. And of course, dryness, where you know God in His love and His mercy, He does give us consolation in prayer, um, uh, whether it be actually a very visible sign of answering our prayers, or whether it be kind of, uh, uh, I guess a good way to describe it is a warm and fuzzy, that there is some spiritual consolation in our prayer, where we can understand everything's going to be all right, you know, and this inner peace comes. Uh, from our prayer. Uh, however, that's not the case, always. We do not always have those moments. Mother Teresa went through the last 40 years of her life without any sort of consolation from God. Um, and, and she sees it as uh, 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 an act of faith on God's part. Uh, and she responded in kind with her own faith. Um, and so uh, this prayer uh, uh, when we experience these times of dryness and times of great distraction and things, it's important for us to turn to God ever more. Um, I forget who I forget who was the one that, that said it. Who said you know or you know uh, if you're busy you should pray. If you know if if you're uh, you know everybody should pray at least a half hour a day, and if you're really busy you should pray an hour. Um, and you know it's one of those things where. It's, it's so counterintuitive. Um, it's kind of one of those, those paradoxes of, you know, if you want to, to, to follow me, you must deny yourself. You know, if you want to be the first, you have to be the last. You know, it's one of those paradoxes of the, the, the Christian faith that uh, uh, the more we pray, the more that God can, can help us. And I've tried that sometimes with my wife when the kids are screaming. And I tell her, I just, I'm just going to go to adoration. And no, that didn't. <laughs> she, knows my, she knows my motivations when I try to do that. No, I'm just joking. I've never done that. But I've thought about it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll uh, finish these up uh, fairly quickly. Uh, temptations in prayer, obviously, lack of faith. The biggest one that probably uh, uh, influences us is simple laziness. Um, and it comes with, uh, from a kind of presumption um, that God knows what I need. I'm just going to you know, keep on going. Yeah, I'll trust in Him, but God knows what I need. But no, we need to be childlike. We need to turn to God for everything. The heart of this is filial trust. It is put to the test when we feel that our prayer is not always heard. The gospel invites us to ask ourselves, ask ourselves about the conformity of our prayer to the desire of the Spirit. And so those two things are very important. The conformity of our prayer to what? The desire of God. The desire of the Spirit. How is our prayer effective? How is our prayer efficacious? Because of the Incarnation and the Paschal Mystery, human things have been given supernatural capabilities through Christ. Christian prayer is one of those. Christian prayer is cooperation with His providence, His plan of love for men. 
The prayer of Jesus makes Christian prayer an efficacious petition. And so it's important for us to understand that, that uh, uh, because of Christ, because of God becoming man, because of the invisible God becoming uh, material, becoming something that we can touch, we participate in that. And that. We can understand this most especially with our children. Almost, you know, at, at the early moments of their life, everything they receive comes from us. Everything they receive, whether that be food, clothing, shelter, and still, you know, even if they are 20 something, it still may be that way. Everything they receive comes through us. And so, in a, in a, in a very similar way, God gives each other, God gives us to each other, so that we're here to help each other out. So that we're here to help support each other, to help build up that kingdom, to help build up the church. And so we must pray without ceasing and persevere in that love. And three enlightening and life-giving facts of faith about prayer. It is always possible to pray. Prayer is a vital necessity. And prayer and the Christian life are inseparable. Those three things, uh, I think we should you know, write them down and post them somewhere where we see them often. Um, you know, we don't need signs that say, drink water. Don't forget to eat. We don't need those things. Why? They're very natural. They're, they're built into us. When we're hungry, you know, when our children are hungry, they scream, they cry, uh, they do all these things. When they're tired, they, you know, they scream, they cry. Um, if they're happy, sometimes they just scream and cry. No, just, but uh, and so it's, uh, the, the the needs of the body are always made manifest very easily and loudly, but the needs of the spirit are not always the case. We don't hear our kids crying, you know, I need to go to Mass, you know. <laughs> you know, they're usually crying because they have to go to Mass. But, and so the needs of the Spirit, the needs of the, the spiritual life of our children, of even ourselves, are less evident. They are not made, and they are not expressed like, say, hunger, thirst, uh, uh, tiredness, and all these things are. And so it's important that we pay more attention to the spiritual life um, because they need... Um, that attention. So with that, let's go ahead and take a quick five minute break. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Like I said, I'm not going to cover obviously everything um, when it comes to Mary. Uh, there's A, there's a lot, and B, we're limited on our time. So what I'd like to do is uh, particularly cover uh, the four dogmas of Mary what it is that we essentially believe about Mary, her earthly life, but also uh, what's sometimes referred to as the fifth doctrine, is uh, Mary's role today. That uh, 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 Mary has a particular role to play in our life, in the life of the church, um, that stems from that life that she was given when she was here on earth. Um, and so while I'm not going to go into all this, there's four main dogmas of Mary, Theotokos and perpetual virgin, perpetual virgin Immaculate Conception, and uh, 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 the Assumption. So those are those four uh, dogmas. And what I mean when I say dogma is that they have been uh, properly defined as such. Um, and so the difference between like a doctrine of the church and a dogma is not the truth of it. They are both equally as true, but the difference that lies between the two is how they have been defined. A dogma is something that has been proposed to believe as such. So um, we'll get into especially these, there are dogmatic statements that this is what we believe about this particular uh, uh, thing about Mary. Uh, doctrinal statements are uh, I don't want to say they're ambiguous in any way, but that they are not proclaimed at that highest uh, uh, declaration. So the first one, Theotokos, God-bearer, or uh, Mother of God. It's Greek, uh, meaning, meaning those two words. It was pronounced in 431 at the Council of Ephesus, and it was pronounced as a response to uh, the Nestorian uh, heresy which said that Jesus was two persons. That uh, Nestorius said that Mary 
was the mother of Jesus, but not the mother of God. So he, he drew a very uh, 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 definitive line be between uh, in, in Christ himself. Whereas in fact Christ is one person with two natures. So Ephesus simply came up with a simple syllogism. Jesus Christ is God. Mary is the mother of Jesus Christ. Therefore, Mary is the mother of God. And it's important to see from, the very, from very early on that this, this understanding of who is Mary, it had nothing to do with who Mary was. They were trying to talk about Jesus Christ. And so uh, 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 St. Cyril, and, and, and as being the main proponent of this, he was one of the ones who, who kind of pointed to that idea that what we say about Jesus, we say we, we, it helps uh, uh, to look at his mother. And so in this way, Mary always points to and protects her son. In this, uh, uh, at the Council of Ephesus, Mary being declared as Theotokos protected the understanding that her son was one person. Her son was not this schizophrenic person, or you know, a combination of two persons. And so, even in the the dogmatic definition of Marius Theotokos, it was to protect the understanding of her son. Some of the places we get this understanding first in uh, sacred scripture, in Luke one thirty one, uh, which is the story of the Annunciation, it says that the Holy One born to you will be called the Son of God. So, if Jesus becomes the Son of God, Mary is going to give birth to him. That would make Mary the mother of God. And again in Galatians, Galatians 4.4, 4, St. Paul says that God sent his Son born of a woman. I don't know what that was. Uh, sacred tradition, we see it uh, most especially in the Apostles' Creed, that earliest form of the creed that we have. Uh, Many saints have written about it, St. Irenaeus, Hippolytus, St. Cyprian. And so from these early saints, we have this first dogma of Mary as the mother of God. This one, uh, and again, the time is 431, be, before any division in the church. Um, before, any, or before any real division in the church. Next, the next dogma that was uh, proclaimed was... Uh, Mary's perpetual virginity. Uh, Pope St. Martin I at the First Lateran Council, 649. Uh, there is a Lateran Council in 1123. That's not the one we're talking about. We're talking about the earlier one in 649. It was not an ecumenical council, but it was later uh, confirmed at an ecumenical council. That Mary, the definition is that Mary was a virgin before during and after the birth of Christ. And we usually don't think about, when we talk about the per perpetual virginity of Mary, we don't think about those three things. Before, during, and after. And so, before. Uh, the Apostles' Creed, obviously, Isaiah, this, this, this one is not the one that's usually contested. Uh, everybody, for the most part, understood Mary to be a virgin before she conceived Christ. During. So that uh, 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 Mary's uh, um, um, would be protected in that same way. She remained a virgin during the birth. So without physical violation of the womb, the saints said, so how was Jesus born? How did Jesus come out of the womb? The saints said, like light through glass. Light is able to pass through glass and does no harm to the glass. In the same way, uh, Mary gave birth to Christ, like light through glass. <clears throat> Mary's physical virginity was a sign also of her spiritual virginity. St. Thomas says that Jesus would not violate uh, in his advent. Both the interior and the exterior virginity are preserved. After, so after Jesus was born, Mary remained a virgin. She never had relations after the birth of Christ. There, she had no other children. The Nicene Creed, we refer to Mary as ever virgin. 
And the saints are Origen, St. Ephraim, John Chrysostom, Ambrose, Augustine, Jerome. They all talk about Mary as being a, a perpetual virgin after the birth of Christ. Um, and also in the liturgy, Canon 1, which is one of the oldest canons we have of the liturgy, talks about Mary as ever virgin. Um, some common objections to the perpetual virginity of Mary uh, is the Matthew 125 where it says, He had no relations with her until she bore a son. Until, and it's important, and they'll always point to this and say, well, it says there in Scripture that, you know, until she bore a son and after that everything, you know, they, you know, they had relations. Well, it's important to understand that the word until does not necessitate relations after the fact. But it just points to a particular point in time. So, uh, uh, when, when uh, Jesus says, you know, I will be with you always until the end of the age. Wait, what happens at the end of the age? Are you going to leave us? No, he's simply pointing to a particular point in time. Until does not ref d until does not infer that something will change after that particular point in time. It simply is a reference point. Uh, a scriptural example is Second Samuel, and so Saul's daughter Michael or Michelle was childless until the day of her death. Does that mean after her death she gave birth? No. It's simply the word until simply points to a particular point in time. So when that objection is placed there, Matthew one twenty five, that he had no relations until she had borne him a son, it does not infer that they had relations after. Uh, another common objection is the term brethren. In Matthew 13, it talks about Jesus and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, and his sisters. So the Greek word that is used there for, uh, uh, for brothers and for sisters is the Greek word adelphos, which simply means kinsman or cousin. It is generic in meaning, and it is not specific like a biological brother. The word of adelphos can be used for male children of the same parents, male descendants of the same parents, male children of the same mother, people of the same nationality, any man, a neighbor. I mean, you think about how generic that is, uh, in, as in Luke 10. And it can also refer to persons united by a common interest, persons united by a common calling, mankind, the disciples, and believers. And so that term adelphos, that Greek word that is used there, is a, is a very generic word. In the case of this scripture passage, it is translated brothers. It is translated sisters. Not referring to blood relation, but simply referring to uh, uh, one of these uh, ten different meanings. I know I went through those too fast. Any questions on those? Yeah. Um, I'm kind of surprised to see Augustine listed there in the after that she was a virgin. Yeah. After, because he's so highly respected by so many Protestants. Do you uh, have a citation reference to that? Um, not on this paper, um, but I can find you one after. I should. I should be able to. If not, I'll email you one later. Um, but yeah, I can get you that um, citation. Sure. Um, and like with anything, if there's any questions after, feel free to email me or anything like that. Um, so again, these these two dogmatic understandings of, of, of the life of Mary, they were made before re any real division in the church. So we're talking uh, 431 and 6. 49. Jason, there's, there's always this question on sure. whether Mary underwent labor pains. But is that not something that's been, that may be a tradition or a discipline, but is it, is, has the church made a... The church simply says that Mary was a virgin during the birth of Christ. 
that there was no physical violation to her virginity to, uh, 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 to mirror her spiritual virginity. Um, so the, uh, uh, the connection with that is always, so the, the consequence of sin is suffering and death. Um, and especially, you know, childbirth. That's always it's a reference to like Genesis uh, and after original sin. Um, and so we'll get to that in a sec because that also that that question there kind of resurfaces again when we talk about the assumption: Did Mary die? And how do we understand that? Um, so we'll cover kind of that the same understanding when we go through there. Anything else on those two before we keep on trucking? So, Mary, uh, Immaculate Conception and Assumption. These are the two most modern declarations, and I say that with great emphasis, declarations of the church on Mary. Um, but as, as we'll see, it's not a new belief. It's not that the church says, you know what, we should really believe this. Um, that within the tradition of the church, based on Scripture, this and in the writings of the saints for all of history, we, this understanding has been there. Um, so the first thing, I, I do want to point out the, at the very top there, devotion to Mary. Uh, uh, St. Thomas makes kind of a three, three distinctions, that there's latria, dulia, and what's called hyperdulia. Fancy words to impress your relatives at Thanksgiving. So latria, adoration and worship. This is given to God alone, period. Dulia. This is honor and reverence appropriate due to a person. So, um, uh, growing up, one of my best friends was, uh, uh, was Hispanic, and I used to love going over to his family functions because they had the best food. Um, but whenever I, went, whenever I went to there, as soon as we got there, before we talked to anybody else, before we went and got food or anything like that, he always had to go and say hi to his grandmother. That's what, all of, that's what he did. That's what all of his brothers, his sisters, his cousins... Everybody did that. When you get there, you go and you say hi to Grandma. It's the same with us. You know, when you go over at Christmas, there's a big gathering. You make a particular effort to go say hi to the, the, the highest person, the matriarch or the patriarch. Uh, you make a particular effort to show that person uh, honor and respect, you know, even among everybody else that is there. In a very similar way, uh, uh, honor and reverence is due to all the saints. But for Mary, there is a unique honor and devotion to her. She is first among the saints. And so St. Thomas gives that term, gives us that term hyperdulia. So all the saints, we give them that reverence, that honor. And Mary, she is that first among the saints. Three reasons. She was full of grace, she was the mother of God, and she was perfectly obedient. So, uh, these two uh, dogmas, the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption. The Immaculate Conception was pronounced ex cathedra by blessed Pope Pius IX in 1854. And he states, At the moment of her conception, Mary was preserved immune from all stain of sin by a singular grace and privilege by the omnipotent God in view of the merits of Jesus the Savior of the human race. And so it's important to see right there in the definition that uh, uh, the particular grace given to Mary is not because of anything that she did, but because of the merits of Jesus Christ. And it's key to understand that the grace of salvation was applied at the moment of her conception. Sources for this is Genesis 3.15. Says uh, uh, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's talking to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will strike at your head while you strike at his heel. Eve uh, uh, was, the, was the mother of the human race. And it's obviously also a foreshadowing of Mary. So her seed is obviously Jesus. The serpent is the devil. His seed is evil. The woman plays a role in crushing the head of the serpent. Jesus and Mary have a 
parallel opposition to Satan. Complete and absolute. So, was Jesus completely uh, at odds with Satan? Was there any sympathy there? Was there any concupiscence to what the devil would, would, could, could tempt Jesus to do? No. There is, it was the, the, the enmity that was between Christ and Satan is full, is complete. If Mary had suffered from original sin or personal sin, her enmity would not be absolute. And then you would have this imperfect, um, somewhat sympathetic to evil person who is going to be the mother of God. When you read, say, the, uh, uh, in the Old Testament, the, when God uh, commands the Israelites to create the Ark of the Covenant, He doesn't go and say, go build a, house, you know, go build a, little, a little, you know, tub uh, 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 for, you know, the Ten Commandments, the manna, and the rod of Aaron to be put in. He doesn't just say, just, you know, just build a box, probably put some poles on it so you guys can carry it around, make it easier, maybe some wheels. He doesn't say that. What, what is, it's one of the most boring parts of Scripture. He says, it will be 43 cubits by 28 cubits. I don't even know what a cubit is. Um, but he is very uh, 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 on point. He is very specific. He wants this vessel to be perfect. And so they build it according to uh, God's word. They make this perfect thing. And so one of the very, very early on, one of the, one of the uh, uh, titles for Mary is Ark of the Covenant. So if you pray a, a litany of Mary, that will be in there. Um, Ark of the Covenant. Why? Because the Ark of the Covenant had the Ten Commandments, the law. It held manna, the bread from heaven. And it also held uh, Aaron's rod, uh, which, which uh, is referenced to the authority of God. Because whenever Moses did something with the rod of Aaron, God was with them. He parted the waters with that. When they were fighting, when the Israelites were fighting, they held up the rod, they were winning the battle. It represented the authority of God. In Christ, we have the fulfillment of the law. We have that bread from heaven, most especially in the Eucharist. And we have also the ten, uh, um, uh, uh, that authority. That Jesus, in, at the end of Matthew's Gospel, says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, baptize, preach, and teach. And so, Jesus is the fulfillment of all those things that were in the Ark of the Covenant. Mary is that new Ark. She held within her womb all of those things in perfection. She held the perfect and fulfilled law. She held the perfect and fulfilled uh, authority of God, the final revelation of God. And she held that perfect sacrifice, that perfect offering of the Eucharist, that bread from heaven. And so, just as God was specific in designing the ark and telling the Israelites how to build the ark, how much more specific would God be to apply the graces of salvation to the woman who is going to be the mother of his son? And so, uh, uh, in that light, we, we look at Mary. Another reference is in Luke 1, 28. And coming to her, the angel, he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Um, so unlike the Hail Mary that we pray, Mary um, was, is actually not in Scripture. That full of grace is the name that the angel calls her. He doesn't say Hail Mary, full of grace. He says Hail, full of grace. Full of grace is the name that the angel gives to Mary. A Greek word there that I'm not even going to try to pronounce um, is a passive perfect participle, meaning that the action has already been completed. So another way to translate that is to say, Mary, you who have been filled with grace. And it is the only place in Scripture where it is used in this tense. And so this declaration, this, this uh, greeting from the angel is very unique in the way that it is presented there in Luke. And also in uh, Luke 142, at the visitation, uh, Elizabeth says, Most blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Again, Mary being uh, that first among the saints. So, where else do we have this in the tradition of the church? 
Um, because it was pronounced in 1854, a lot of people say, well, you guys kind of just made it up shortly before then. This isn't tr true. And we can trace it through, uh, through implicit belief, growing explicit belief, and explicit formulations that go back to the 12th century. And so in the first of the fourth centuries, Mary is compared to Eve before Eve's fall, implying that Mary is free from sin. Titles used by the church fathers for Mary, all holy, all pure, most innocent, miracle of grace, all together without sin, and pure than the angels. All of these were titles that the early church fathers gave to Mary. In the 5th through 11th centuries, there was growing explicit belief. St. Ambrose refers to Mary as being free from all stain of sin. St. Severus is the first to call Mary Immaculate in 538. The first to call Mary Immaculate. And in 600, 748, again, St. Sophronius and St. Andrew of Crete referring to Mary as immaculate, as free from sin. The first magisterial approval was in 466 uh, by Pope Sixtus IV. Again, before, you know, kind of the main division within Christianity. We, we did go through the East and the West Schism in 1054, um, but this belief that Mary was ever virgin continued in both the East and the West. There was no division among the understanding of Mary between the East and the West, even though the schism had taken place. St. Bernard of Clairvaux and St. Thomas Aquinas, both doctors of the church, both of them had difficulties with the Immaculate Conception, and they thought that it would violate the way original sin was transmitted. Original sin is transmitted from through the bodies, from infected body to newly infused soul. So from St. Anne, who is not perfect, who gave Mary her body, uh, uh, St. Thomas and St. Bernard uh, uh, had difficulty understanding how it was that uh, the grace of salvation was applied to them before that. These were problems not because of Mary's unworthiness, but because they were confusing. And the remedy came with blessed Dun Scotus in 1308. He says that through the absence of grace at the moment of conception, not through the body is original sin transmitted. It is the absence of grace in the person. The soul is infused with grace appropriate to it. So original sin is not this positive effect on the person, but an absence of grace. Baptism restores that sanctifying grace. Uh, and he talks about preservation, redemption, that Mary was human, thus needed a savior. Mary was saved by an application of the graces of salvation at the moment of her conception. She is saved in the highest possible fashion because she never contracted original sin. So, does Mary need a savior? Absolutely. Was Mary saved? Yes. But she was saved in the highest possible fashion. Again, why? Not because of any uh, particular merit of Mary, but because she was chosen to be the mother of Jesus. Would there then be no reference to Mary having to be baptized? Right. 1854, Pope Pius IX consulted the bishops all over the world about making it a dogma, as it was already a doctrine. It was common belief like we just traced it through. It was belief in the church that Mary was immaculately conceived. And so he says, should we dogmatically define this? 590 said yes, 7 said no, and 68 had doubts. Millions of the laity had already called for this definition, saying, what is it? Please define this. And so he did. And so uh, uh, a way that we can kind of understand this, you know, so if you think about a person going from uh, uh, um, um, uh, non-existence to existence, from, from, from uh, um, not being created to being created, that for, for humans, Adam and Eve kind of put this muddy puddle in front of us that we have to pass through in order to 
enter into life. Uh, uh, once we get on the other side of that, we have access uh, uh, to God's salvation. God's salvation is offered to us through baptism and the rest of the sacraments. Mary, not beca again, not because of any particular merit of hers, but because she was to be the mother of Jesus, that you know, God kind of gentlemanly laid his coat down to pass over that muddy puddle and enter into life free from that stain of sin, free from uh, that mud of original sin. And so, did she need a savior? Absolutely. Was she, uh, was she saved? Yes. But it was in a very unique way. Why? Because she had a very unique role to play. And again, it was something that was there in the church, it just hadn't really been defined. And it's also important to note that with the Immaculate Conception, um, if anybody remembers the, uh, uh, um, the uh, Saint Bernadette, um, what was it that Mary, does anybody remember how Mary revealed uh, herself to uh, Saint Bernadette and Lourdes? She said what? I am the Immaculate Conception. Do you know when that was? When Saint Bernadette? 1850. And that's why, when if you've ever watched the story, the, the first thing the bishop says to uh, Bernadette is, is, where did you hear that? Because it was a seven-year-old, or however, 12-year-old, however old she was, saying the words, Immaculate Conception. It was not even defined yet by the church. Go even further back, 1830. We have the uh, apparition to uh, St. Catherine Labore. Uh, uh, who is given the, uh, uh, the miraculous medal, which says, O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. So again, 1830, 24 years before, uh, 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 before the declaration, we have the understanding, we have a, a, an apparition from Mary that she is uh, conceived without sin. And so... Uh, uh, the final dogma, the Assumption of Mary. This was proclaimed ex cathedra by Pope Pius XII on November 1st, 1950. He states that the Immaculate Mother of God, ever virgin, Mary, having completed the course of her earthly life, was assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. Again, he consulted the bishops all over the world. Should it be defined? And do you and your flock desire it to be defined? He does not ask them, what do you think of this dogma? What do you, is this true? No, it's about the definition of it. Again, it's something that the church had always believed, but they were looking to define it. The results, 1,210 said yes to, uh, to both um, out of 1,232. And over the period of 95 years, 8 million letters from the faithful asked the Pope to uh, define this for them. And again, Mary triumphs over sin in her immaculate conception and therefore also triumphs over death in her assumption. So sources, uh, again, Genesis uh, 3.15 in the beginning, the woman shares absolute enmity with her son. Uh, as a, in, a, in, a, in opposition to the devil, that she shares in that complete opposition. St. Paul teaches us that the consequences of Satan's seed is sin and death. And death is that separation of the body and soul. It is the result of sin. Mary, having been conceived without sin, does not suffer death. A uh, couple of uh, uh, other references in the book of Revelation. Where is this in the writing of the saints? St. Saint Gregory of Tours in 593 talks about the holy body of Mary on a cloud. 7th and 8th centuries, St. Andrew of Crete, St. John Damascene, St. Germain. And it's also important to know that from the very beginning of the church, uh, uh, from the time of the apostles, one of the things that people did uh, uh, was uh, when a particular uh, uh, person died, a particular Christian died, they marked their grave 
They knew where that person was buried. They venerated that place. There is no tomb of Mary that's ever been uh, 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 preserved throughout all of time. There's no relics of Mary circulating. We know where the bones of Peter are. Peter knew Mary. We know where, where, where Peter was. We know where the, other, where the other apostles were, where their bones are. We have the chains that held St. Paul. We have all of these uh, 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 tombs. We have all of these uh, places. But for Mary, it's missing. Um, not because they didn't think she was important, but because there was nothing there. She, is, she was assumed body into heaven, a body and soul into heaven. 13th century onward, many saints write about the Assumption of Our Lady. As early as the 5th and 6th centuries in Syria and Egypt, and in Rome in the 8th century, uh, the Assumption of Mary was uh, uh, in the prayers of the liturgy. And so there's liturgical prayers dating that far back, referring to Mary as being assumed into heaven. So, did Mary die? This is that you know, great question, and it's uh, similar to, to, to Lister's question there. So, some say that she did not die, but was simply assumed into heaven. Others say she suffered a very brief separation of body and soul, which they refer to as a dormition, because she shared and, follow her, and followed her son in all things. And so they said, you know, especially when you talk about, you know, devotion to the Sacred Heart, that the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of Jesus beat, uh, uh, beat together that Mary followed Christ in everything that she did. She was completely obedient. She would want to follow uh, her son in everything. And so, did she experience death? Some say she experienced it not in the way that we will, but uh, in a, again, in a very unique way. Others say, and most of the time it's just commonly referred to as the Dormition, simply Mary fell asleep and then was assumed into heaven. Um, and so, again, going back to the definition that the church gives. Mary, having completed the course of her earthly life, was assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. Um, and so it, it does not get into the details that, you know, on Tuesday evening, you know, Mary finished dinner and then, you know, went and laid down, you know, and things like that. So it does not uh, really get into any of that. Any questions on those or any of those four dogmas? And again, I know I'm covering a lot in this brief period, um, um, but these things are important. Again, not, uh, not because Mary is there to detract us from her son, but that she is there to bring us to her son. Um, you know, if you really want something, you go to their mother. Um, and we also have to see it in the, in the, in the same way, you know, the, the dangerous game of playing, you know, what if I was God? Um, how would I come to earth? God could have come to earth in any way. Any way. A glorious cloud with lightning bolts and stuff. And so lastly, and so I, the, the last thing I want to talk about is Mary's spiritual mother and her role today. Because as Catholics, this is, this is one of the main things that sets us apart. We continue to pray to Mary. Um, the idea of spiritual mother uh, uh, is in, uh, uh, there's particular scripture passages that I've put there that we're not going to go through all of them. In sacred tradition, uh, many church fathers refer to Mary as mother of the living, the new Eve. St. Jerome talked about death through Eve, life through Mary. Um, the prayer that we began with, again dating back to 250 AD, turning to Mary to bring uh, uh, our petitions to her son. And so kind of a way we can define this is to say that Mary in giving birth to Jesus truly communicated to us the supernatural life of grace that allows us to become children of God. She did not give birth to us physically, but in giving birth to Jesus made it possible for her members to receive spiritual life in her son. She became spiritual mother at the Annunciation and it was perfected at Calvary and continues with her in heaven. And so at Calvary where Christ says, John, there is your mother, uh, 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 
Mary, there is your son. And so kind of this gift to the church of Mary as spiritual mother. Uh, uh, a very good scripture uh, passage uh, kind of that foreshadows this maternal mediation uh, comes from 1 Kings. Um, let me see if I have it on there. Yes, first it's on the next page. When to, and First Kings two nineteen. It's what's called the Gabira, uh, uh, or Great Lady. And so two nineteen says, so Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the the mother of Solomon. So Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him about Adonijah. The king rose to meet her and bowed before her. He then sat down on his throne. A seat, uh, a seat was brought for the mother of the king, and she sat down at his right hand. She said, I have, I have one small request to make you. Do not refuse me. My mother, the king, answered, Make your request, for I will not refuse you. And so, very similar to the, the ancient times of Israel, the queen was not the wife of the king, but the queen was the mother of the king. And so Mary, uh, in fulfilling her role as mother, not just bringing Christ into the world in a very real way, but in fulfilling her role as mother, continues that maternal mediation as queen of heaven and queen of earth. She intercedes for her son, and like Solomon there, uh, we bring our intentions to Our Lady. Our Lady brings them to her son. Not because, not because we were saying, well, we just bring them to Our Lady because you know Jesus, you know, is this, you know, this, you know, overlord who you know will not grant our request. But we have to think of Mary as a, as a beautiful gift that Jesus could have could have come to, into this world in any way he wanted to. But he decided to become truly like us. And in his advent, he also gave us his mother. He said, my mother will be your mother. And so that maternal mediation never leaves us. Like the presence of Christ, that maternal mediation stays with us even though she's in heaven. And so we turn to her. We, 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 we fly to her patronage, as we say there, and we bring Mary our petitions. Um, and so it's kind of in that light that we understand Mary's role today, that, uh, uh, that she still continues um, uh, that role in bringing salvation to the world. She, she gave Jesus his body. His body brought us salvation. That salvation continues today through the merits of Jesus Christ. But we also have our mother as a gift. And so we turn to her, not because we do not trust Jesus, but because we love the gift that Jesus gave us in his mother.